What's been your most rewarding and most challenging business venture and why? Most rewarding was building my dad's business for him. And it was the most challenging. The first 12 years of my career are the most interesting of my career. To be 22 and have so much confidence and passion and ambition and be able to go into a mental place that you're gonna spend the next decade or two building a business for not yourself, even, you know, even if it's your dad, it's not for yourself, and be grossly undercompensated the whole time and work in a retail environment six or seven days a week for 13 to 17 hours a day was just like, you know that, you know Rocky IV? You know that movie Rocky IV? You know how he gets ready for Drago and he's like in the snow with the fucking log on his back and just like doing that shit? I just basically did that for 12 years. Like it was just such a fucking like, I'm gonna turn off everything and just go to the woods and disappear for 12 years. And it's just super rewarding because I really wanted to do that for my parents. But it also meant that at 34, I basically had zero money. And um, that, that required a level of conviction and humility that has serviced me really well. You know, a lot of people, like, a lot of people when they really know my story, like the actual people that watched it from my teenage years, they're flabbergasted by the level of growth from 34 to 47, the last 13 years. And for me, when I think about it, I'm like, it was just the training, you know? I was in such a, like, fucking crazy mental place that once I had freedom to do it for myself, I just went so hard and so creative. And so it was super rewarding, but incredibly challenging because especially as I got into my late 20s, early 30s, like when I went to go buy an apartment and they laughed me out of the bank because they're like, you don't have anything. I'm like, right, I don't have anything. Like, I don't own shit, I have no money. I'm like thinking like, you know, I just took a business from three to 75 billion. I'm like fucking really good at my, and they're like, this is cute, but you don't own anything. You have nothing. I'm like, I remember walking out of there, I was like pumped. I was like, yeah, I have nothing. You know, like, like, like it, was a, it was really motivating in a weird way. And so, you know, that was, that was hard. And this is why I make so much content about patience. Listening to these fuckers at 27, who were like, ah, and I'm like, you fucking asshole. I was making $63,000 a year at 27, working in a fucking liquor store. You're way ahead of me. Stop crying and like figure this out. Dwelling and pondering and crying doesn't do shit, and it especially doesn't do shit in this eco chamber. In this arena, there is no crying. You can cry. You're just gonna lose. And I have bad news about complaining and crying. Let me tell you something about complaining and crying that's really, really gonna hurt for all you complainers out there. Nobody gives a shit. And let me give you a preview who gives a shit. The following people give a shit when you complain. The other losers around you your sick, broken parent that secretly wants to hold you down so that you're not more successful than them. And let me remind you one more time, the other fucking losers around you. If you leave here and start your process of really knowing what makes you happy, of who are you really, if you could stop chipping away the voices from the outside, if you can start figuring out what you're scared of, If you want to actually do something, even in the light of the picture that I'm painting right now, who are you scared to fail in front of? The reason so many of you are not doing what you want to do is you're scared to fail in something. You're scared that your brother will judge you, your wife, your girlfriend, your husband, and most scary, your mom or your dad. You need to eliminate that and or own that fear and put yourself in a position to succeed. Because with all of this, With all of this, we are now in the greatest era. For the first time ever, with no fucking money, with no goddamn connections, this can put you on the map. If you're good enough, if you are good enough to be up here, to make bling bling, if you are good enough, nobody's stopping you. Not fucking Donald Trump, not the fucking Russians, nobody. 
If you are a minority, if you are a female, if you are a transgender, if you're a fucking alien, the market doesn't give a fuck. If you make the best shit, you will win. Do you know how sucky it was to be a nerd 20 years ago? But now the market is rewarding fucking nerds and now they're rock stars. Clap it up if you're a fucking nerd. The best part about that was so, some dude was clapping for him. I said, clap it up if you're a fucking nerd. He was like, it's awesome. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm so grateful. I was born in the Soviet Union. Both of my grandfathers spent 10 years in jail for being Jewish, right? Like more people in America died last year because a coconut fell off a tree and hit him in the head than from terrorism. I'm just gonna say that one more time. Yeah, true. Funny thing about data, it doesn't fucking lie. More Americans died last year because a coconut fell from a tree, hit them on the head, they died. Then terrorism. As somebody who aspires to be one of the great brander and marketers of his generation, I refuse for hate and horseshit and negativity to outmarket me. I will sit here today, I will sit here on the slides on every one of those platforms when they put it up. I hope they do. Follow me back there, you told me you would. Thank you very much. On stage, on those platforms, every day, 24-7, 365, I will remind you that life is phenomenal. That nobody gives a shit, so the government or your mommy's not gonna help you. You gotta do it, own your shit, but it's never been better. We've got a bigger chance than ever. We can do our thing. And so I flew from London, I just flew in, I barely fucking made it to this talk. All the fucking guards here are fucking gangsters. Right? Fuck those guards. I barely made it here, and I don't know, I've got some other talk now for 45 minutes about marketing on another stage, and then I'm flying home. And the only reason I wanted to be here, the only reason I wanted to be in Lisbon for four hours today is because I knew there was a lot of you, I knew there was a lot of youngsters, and we are choosing what to listen to on social media now. So we're going into what we want to hear, and a lot of people need to hear one of two things today, which is, this is the greatest era to ever be alive and be an entrepreneur or executive if you want it, and stop complaining and dwelling because nobody gives a fuck. Trying to make no profit for as long as possible. So now I'm gonna really fucking give you a brain twist after what I just said to him. So now I have no money and I start a new business and I decide to make no money. (laughs) Right, so Vayner started in 09. First two years AJ really ran it. I still had to run the business plus I wrote Crush It and the Gary Vee thing started happening. So we did 1.3 million the first year, 3.7 the next year. And then I came full time and we went from 3.7 to 14 and from 14 to 27, from 27 to 49. And the whole time we poured all the money back in the business and paid each other $100,000. The pivotal decision was feeding the business, not my ego or my bank account, or my vices. How many people here are over the age of 40? Raise your hand. Yes, my crew. I think for a lot of us, we have opinions of Gen Z coming into the workforce. Uh, I have unlimited employees who tell me they only wanna work Tuesday to Thursday um, and be promoted within the first seven days of being in the organization. And I'm sure a lot of us have a ton of feelings about that, but the reality is is that these kids are coming up with options. We in this room did not have the ability to make $50,000 a year dancing on TikTok and getting brand deals. And so I don't think Gen Z is lazy, I just think they're living with options that we didn't have. But the reality is is that accountability, kindness, patience, um, tenacity, all the traits that we talked about in the book, It's really cooking a meal. I think all of us know as we manage and build, 
if you're over indexing on one or two things without having a complete meal, there, it creates vulnerability. There's unlimited value and tenacity. I was born in the Soviet Union. My family came here with nothing. We lived with eight family members in a studio apartment. I'm not sitting here in front of you without ungodly levels of conviction, tenacity, and hard work. At the same token, the amount of people that do burn out or are unhappy in their journey to dollars or many of the other mental aspects of being a human being, if you don't find balance within that, and more importantly for me, What's so impressive, Dave, about what you and the family have done and many of the leaders here, how many people here by show of hands have been in the organization for more than five years? Raise your hand. How about 10? How about 15? I mean, that, that's the punchline. To me, the only thing that's interesting about when you're building a meaningful business is what's your retention. And retention, for a lot of us who raised our hands over 40, as we all know, 15, 20 years ago, the majority of retention was predicated on the financial upside of continuing the course, and for a select crew, the and a good amount of the people, the titles that came along with that. I think retention going forward will require us to be a little more well-rounded uh, because of the optionality and because of the way the internet's growing, and I think we do have to take a strong stance on figuring out how to incentivize people, and I call it really reverse engineering. I'm not overly emotional on what drives my 1,900 employees globally. If, the, if it's money, mazel tov, I'm in. I understand that game. If it's titles, if you need that for your uh, ego or leverage or your LinkedIn, I'm about that life. Happy to go there if it's appropriate. Um, if it's work-life balance, I'm all about that, but the kind candor that I talked about in the book comes along with that. When I sit down with somebody and they say, Gary, I need work-life balance, I'm like, I'm good, but you need to understand that we're building a business and there are gonna be people in this organization who are gonna go harder and want different things and as long as you're comfortable in realizing there's no participation in hanging around trophy game here, like you will be compensated appropriately and well, but if you, there are going to be people that lap you in this organization and somebody that now reports to you has a high chance of having you report to them based on this need. As long as you are accountable to what makes you happy, then I'm about that. And I think that is a modern conversation that most of us didn't grow up with. I sure didn't in the last 25 years. And these combos are landing. And I think one of the things that we need to think about as leaders in here is there is a generation of employees that don't have the same frameworks we did. And so for me, I'm agnostic. You wanna, you wanna be the C, I mean, I had a kid come in the other day, I wanna be the CEO of a company, I'm like, great. He was like, what do I do? I'm like, work 24 hours a day for 14 years and give yourself maybe a chance to be in the mix. And if that's not your life, that's awesome. And so I think we need to start thinking about optionality in the way that we manage and we build this organization. When I think about the growth four years in a row and all that stuff, like things are changing and we know it. And I think for a lot of us, you may not like it, but the world and technology and innovation, both on the marketing and the management side, doesn't really care what you think. The world's gonna do the world. And it's our job to adjust to that reality. And so I think there's so many interesting things brewing on continuing the next decade or two to have the hands be five and 10 and 15s and 20 years in here, some of us are gonna have to compromise on ideologies that we lived for ourselves for the best interest of the organization. That's what I'm spending time on. I worked in a retail store seven days a week, 15 hours a day for 20 years. Like, I, that's how I saw it, that's what I liked. But I don't have any emotion for the people I don't view them lesser than if they want to live that nine to five life, five days a week. I just don't want them to think that they're going to be the EVP of the company if they do that. And so there's a lot of these kind of combos that I think are really healthy and something worth talking about. The other thing that I'm spending a lot of time on thinking about is the whole marketing shift. It's, you know, we did three Super Bowl spots at VaynerMedia. Uh, in this last Super Bowl, so I'm sure it's top of mind. We did the Pepsi spots with Ben Stiller and Steve Martin, and we did the Mr. Peanut, Roast the Peanut, uh, Mr. Peanut campaign. That's marketing that we all kind of grew up with. As you saw in the clip of my intro with Larry King, he's like, what are you? I'm like, we're modern day Mad Men. What does that mean? How many people watched Mad Men on TV? Just raise your hands. Great, solid. 
So, you know, that's an ad firm. That's how Madison Avenue was. I think a lot of us have grown up with it. But it was always television down, print down, billboard down. I think everyone here is aware that digital is now a part of our lives. Um, You know, I think a lot of people struggle with digital being part of our lives. Watch this. How many people here, by the way, lying is the devil. So, so, and when I ask this question, I don't want half, I want full. Ready? How many people here recall saying to themselves or to somebody else 15, 17 years ago, I'm not getting a cell phone. I don't need one of those things. My pager is perfect. Raise your hand. I appreciate it, my man back there. All right, seven, eight. Next, how many people remember saying, I'm not getting that expensive iPhone. My Blackberry is awesome, plus I need the buttons on my Blackberry. Don't lie, raise your hands. Look around, look around, look around. Here's a favorite of mine. Remember, lying is the devil. How many people here 15 years ago said, I'm not getting a Facebook account. That's for kids and my children. I'll never be on Facebook and have had a Facebook account since. Don't lie, raise your hands. This. This, what we just went through for 45 seconds, is the only thing I think about. The only thing I care about with marketing is selling stuff. My daddy had a liquor store. He didn't care about if people thought the video was funny or interesting. He didn't care what my opinion of a good ad was or his opinion. He cared how much Pinot Grigio and Johnny Walker Black sold. Marketing is an engine for business. The problem and the opportunity is, is marketing is going through the biggest shift it's gone through since we transitioned from a predominant radio consuming society to a predominant television society. The internet is now 30 years old. You know, it's really starting to hit maturity. We're there now. And what's happening on the modern day internet is remarkable. What's even more remarkable is how many people in this room, in this hotel, in this beautiful city and in this country continue to underestimate the power of the modern marketing and how much they continue to overestimate yesterday. The concept of humanity is very simple. I'm going to overvalue yesterday because it's not scary, I know it. I'm gonna, for a small group of people that I roll with in Silicon Valley and others, they overestimate tomorrow. They're like, if you're not on VR selling cars, you're an idiot. There's like nine people using VR. So I'm watching everybody way, way over value yesterday. I promise. What I want for all of you is I want you to be obsessed with today. For example, today, Facebook Reels. If you know what TikTok is and if you know what Instagram Reels are, Facebook has a version called Reels. All the cool kids are doing everything on TikTok and Instagram because that's the new wave. Meanwhile, because so few people are making content for Facebook Reels, yet there are tens and hundreds of millions of people consuming those Reels, the supply and demand of attention and output is off kilter and one of the biggest opportunities in marketing this second is doing videos and pictures on Facebook Reels to sell stuff. That is the framework that we are going to want to achieve in this room and because this is real family and I watch how Dave talks about it and if you're trying to raise money for your PTA and if your cousin is running for mayor in Cincinnati and if you have a little time for a side hustle and you like selling t-shirts It is the framework of our society. The biggest reason the world's confused right now is they don't understand that the attention of our society is shifting so fast to new platforms. Think about commercials. Super Bowl's the best. I'm on CNBC saying these are a steal at $7 million a spot. Why? Because 100 plus Americans will actually watch it. Meanwhile, streaming is eating up all television except sports. How many people here now have Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime and are consuming shows on that? Raise your hand. Dave, I want you to look at this crowd. One more time, raise it high all the way. I don't know if you know this, these are not 20 year olds. (laughs) This crew, the OGs, you're watching Hulu and Netflix, which means every minute you're doing that is a minute you're not watching cable. 
It's a minute you're not watching local television. And oh, by the way, the random times you find yourself on cable and regular television, predominantly watching sports, when the commercial comes on, I promise you're not consuming it. Even this crowd is grabbing their phone and doing something or going to the bathroom or whatever you're doing, but I promise you, you're not excited for a Jeep going up a mountain telling you it's 399. That is not what you're hyped for in between watching the Housewives or the Bulls game. The only thing I think I'm great at is being me. I really believe that. I think self-awareness and leaning and lack of judgment on one's shortcomings are two incredible ingredients. Sleep falls into that category. I just have always needed to sleep. You know, I wasn't functional. I'm not functional at three, four, five. I don't feel great. I don't know why I would do that. And I've always thought people were confused about time. It, you know, the badge of like, I work 18 hours a day, I love that. But I also work 18 hours a day incredibly effectively. So my 18 hours are like some people's month. Hmm. And so whether I get seven hours of work in a day because that's the serendipity of what's up my life or an hour or 18 and it ebbs and flows, always 10, 11, 12, I, I love working, I'm effective. And I, I've always, you know, some of my friends over the last four or five years when I've created better clarity on how I do this, they're like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm out grinding you, Gary. I'm going 18 hours a day. I'm like, listen, I'm, I was, I'm like, yeah, but you watched three hours of YouTube videos. <laughs> like, like being effective and efficient in your time. And, and that's why I've always been very okay with progressive thinking when people thought I wouldn't. You know, yeah. when they're like, oh, four, out, four, four day work week. A lot of my friends the last three, four years are like, you hate that shit, right? I'm like, not necessarily. I actually love it. I would love for the world to be off for three days, because then I could get three days, I could get more rest. It's what do you do in those four days? Yeah, but isn't that affected a lot about this like FaceTime culture? That is, you know, a lot, it's different in different countries, I guess, but yes. like if you're in, my experience from big corporations is that you're expected to stay there until your boss goes, 100%. and then that can follow you even if you start your own company. 100%. Because you feel satisfied in a way if you just stay there for a long time. Yeah, and like, by the way, I grew up with that. My dad had a liquor store. We opened and closed the store. Yeah. I didn't even know what it meant to leave something that you were doing early. Yeah. I wasn't in office culture. When I got when I started VaynerMedia, I'm like, when is the right time to leave? You know, like, yes, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. But this goes back to the bigger point that I focus on, which is like, whether you love me or hate me, whether you love somebody who's got a different point of view in the world or hate them and everything in between, you need to figure yourself out. The end, like there's people that work nine to three, four days a week. There's people that work 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week and everything in between. And there's ways to do it well and there's ways to not do it well, all in between. And the question becomes, who are you? One of the things that is incredibly scary for me in my growth of popularity is I don't want people to parrot me. I want them to parrot me in the concept of fighting for happiness through self-awareness and then doing things that fulfill you. But I don't want them to directly copy me. And I think that that's a big responsibility that I think anybody that gains popularity, whatever you're doing works for you. Communicate in a way of what the bigger framework of that is, not the individuality. Gary, what's your morning routine? And people ask me that as if that morning routine would work for them. Yeah, and then they're gonna be successful right. if they Right, I, I wake up and look at my phone immediately because I have a global company and I'm worried that Singapore had a fire in the building the night before. Like, I have responsibilities. Other people want to meditate for 30 minutes before they touch technology. That sounds brilliant to me. <laughs> like, when, my, when my friends are like, Gary, you gotta do what I do. I wake up and then I meditate for an hour, don't even look at the phone. I'm like, that's brilliant. For me, I actually release anxiety by looking quickly and making sure nothing's on fire because Anything that's like bad, we lost a client, this person quit, like normal stuff that people think, that isn't like, my great strength as an entrepreneur and a businessman is I actually don't give a shit about the business. Let me break it down. I love the art of the game more than the trophies that come from the game. So for me, losing a client is not fun. I don't want to, but I'm not crushed because of the revenue. Mm. I live within my means. 
Uh, and now, now all of a sudden, my saving money content's about to do well. <laughs> I've been putting out all this saving money content. Nobody likes it at all. I'm like, ugh. I have a funny feeling it's about to become very popular. When you have a lot of responsibilities, you have different frameworks. Yeah. And so, but by the way, and this is very important to hear, and this is, I hope helps someone. But if tomorrow I decide I want to meditate for an hour because I convince myself, well, I could have just slept an extra hour, so what's the difference? Because that's logical. Then I will. And I think too many people struggle with changing their mind. Mm. For me, it's one of the things I'm most proud of. You know, tenacity matters. You know, I think the tact when you're trying to reach someone matters as well. Some people can come off incredibly entitled, can come off incredibly unsettling. But there are many people who will email or DM or reach out 7, 12, 40 times. And I'm incredibly comfortable with it because I can sense the tenacity balance. It's a humble mm. hunger versus an anxious expectation. Yeah. Right? And so, because they come in both forms. It's either very frantic and almost like you owe them and, and mm. they just think that, and then they watch something like this and they're like, oh, I'll just email every day. But when there's no soul behind it, whereas other times you can tell that the person's being thoughtful, they understand that you're you on the other side are trying, mm. uh, you know, and and I appreciate that. And and I get excited sometimes when I'm able to get to it. Like many times in the last 15 years, especially last five years, as more demand has come my way, I actually get a sense of enjoyment when I'm like, you know what? This is gonna, this is the time I'm gonna reply to Carol Thompson or Steve Johnson. Cause like you see them, you see them, you see mm. them, but you're trying. And for people that are listening or watching, when you have somebody on the other end who's getting bombarded with demand, many of those individuals actually really want to do it. But for me, for example, where it really went awry was I had to take a step back and say, look, my family, my own health and well-being, and really the responsibility of the 2,000 employees I have, I started realizing six years ago, five years ago, I'm like, damn it, I'm more accessible to a person that reaches out to me for the first time than somebody within my own organization. Yeah. And uh, and so I've had to make those adjustments, but I still fight. I'm the flight here from New York to Sweden, snuck in a couple email replies and a couple <laughs> DMs. Like, I'm believe it or not, that's the biggest thing I miss about traveling. For the last two years, Zoom, I am uh, programmed like a robot. Yeah. Pure efficiency. I used to reply to people because I would get up and go to the bathroom in between meetings in my office, and that's where I would get certain things done. With Zoom, it's like poof, 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 poof. there was no serendipity time. The airport and traveling was when I would catch up with friends, catch up with my family, catch up with like the fans and the community that got wiped the last two years. And so it's um, now that we're just starting to come out of our shell, I am actually enjoying it. I missed it, and I knew I would. I've loved so many things about the new world of you know not having to fly to Chicago for one meeting and fly back. It's good on your health, all that. I'm excited about both. I'm a very big and guy. I think most of the world's problems, most people think the world is about or. This is right mm. versus that. Or it's this or that. And I think it's and. And so I'm excited about the digital world and the physical world. And, uh, and that's how I think about it.